Well, um, I came back from a trip the other week, and uh, our testimony recorder said, uh, yeah, well, you were gone. We got four doctor-confirmed cases of cancer being healed. <laughs> That's the case. I should go away more often, but one, one of those has a, a, a trail of testimonies that kind of follow that's pretty amazing. And so the story is that this gentleman came, uh, he had ca cancer in his esophagus and uh, got prayer, went down under the power, got up knowing that God had done something, but obviously had to go back to the doctor and get it checked out. So he left, and then the next week, um, a lady who was a friend of his came into the healing rooms, and uh, this this gentleman's from Fresno, so she came up from Fresno to the healing rooms. She had had a titanium hip put in, and, and because of the operation several years earlier, had lost all the feeling in her right leg and the movement in her right foot. She couldn't move it at all. She goes down. When she gets up, all the feeling in her leg is restored, and the movement in her foot is back. <laughs> her husband, who received prayer for his sinuses and for his eyesight, didn't have anything amazing happen happened during the prayer, but as they were walking from the healing room over to where they filmed testimonies, he's walking over there and all of a sudden he goes, I can take a deep breath, my sinuses are completely healed. And then right at that moment his eyesight goes fuzzy. So he takes his contacts out and realizes his eyes are completely healed. <laughs> well, the gentleman who had, had been... Um, well, during the, the testimony, she's filming the testimony, she's telling the story. She said, well, the reason I'm here is because I'm friends with a gentleman who came last week who was healed of esophageal cancer. He went to the doctors. The doctors confirmed that you're completely healed, so that's why I'm here. So during, that, during the, the months after that, he put on 20 pounds of weight. He regained weight, 20 pounds that he had lost, totally healed. So all the people around him are going, what has happened to you? including his landlord, who had been bedridden for a long, long time, and uh, saw the change in him, and uh, he said, yeah, I went to the healing rooms at Bethel Church, I'll take you. So he brought his landlord up here. She gets completely healed. And <laughs> and, uh, he's, a, he's a veteran, so he'd been being treated at the VA hospital. And so the doctor is so astounded at what happened, they didn't understand, so they form a special board, they invite in special, just to study his case, because they don't understand what's happening. So this guy, he makes his own brochure, right? He puts together his own brochure, tells his testimony, talks about the healing rooms, gives directions to the healing rooms in his brochure, and is passing it out to all these doctors at the hospital. And and for, and for the, so all the people around him see the, just the transformation in. So the last few months, every couple of weeks, he brings up a carload of people every couple of weeks with him, and he calls himself the Bethel Tour Guide. <laughs> That's awesome. I, just, I one, one more yeah, really good. short one that was cool yesterday. Um, as you might know, we're doing Skype healing um, in the healing rooms now. So you can call in over Skype and get prayer over the internet from anywhere in the world and, uh, Yesterday, I felt like I was supposed to have a, a couple who is uh, beyond the, the Skype generation, uh, so to speak, do, do the ministry on the, on the, on the and they're like, uh, Skype? How, they didn't know how to pronounce it, and so, so they're praying for people on the internet, and this one lady calls in, and they, they pray for her, and, uh, and then they hang up with her, and then 30 minutes later, she calls back and says, you prayed for me, I had diabetes, I did my tests, and all my numbers are normal, I've been healed of diabetes. <laughs> Come on. And then the, then the prayer servant has to admit to her, you know, I couldn't understand what you were saying earlier because the, the internet connection was bad. So I didn't know what you were saying, so I just prayed by faith that God knew and He would touch you. <laughs> so you get that's totally awesome. <laughs> Yeah, God, that's awesome. Thank you, Lord. Thanks, my friend. Wow. Uh, last, last Sunday, I think it was, or maybe the Sunday before that, uh, a young man came up to me and, and hands me a piece of paper, which is, it's always, you know, risky. Because about a good seven out of ten of those are just weird. <laughs> okay. And so I, you know, I didn't open it, because I never do, because I don't want the person to see the expression on my face when I think it's so weird, you know. 
So I just thank you. I put it in my pocket. We, we were doing ministry time. And uh, I pulled it out later to read. I found out earlier, uh, before the young man had come, was his mom invited him to take a trip back east with her in the car. And they were going to drive back to a southeastern state where he was going to be with some relatives. And uh, she informed him along the drive that uh, she was going to go be with her new boyfriend and leave him in this other state. And he was obviously upset, and so he, you know, they, they were arguing in the car. They stopped for gas or something. Uh, he went in the store, went in the bathroom, came out, and there was a bag on the counter. And the tenant said that, the, the, the uh, attendant said, uh, your mom left this for you. She left. And so this young man is now in, a, in another state <coughs> without a ride on the other side of the country. So he began to hitchhike, and he was picked up with, by, we don't know, but sounds like a believer. They gave him a ride to his house. They fed him. They got him a bus ticket. And uh, he took the bus back to Reading. He's homeless now. He's wandering around the streets. And I read the note a few minutes after he gave it to me without knowing any of this, and it says, I want to thank all of you for what you're, what you're building here. He says, I, I was homeless, but I saw some happy people coming up the hill. So I followed them, and I came into this place. Thank you so much for radically impacting my life. And later in the, the next week, we heard testimony that this young man has been gathered up in this community. He's been invited into your homes. He has, I'm sure Christmas was great for him. He's, uh, he hooked up with Chris O, imagine that. And, uh, and he's, his life is, a, is just another planet right now. So I just want to say congratulations awesome. for being the happy Come people. On. That's so good. Isn't that great? I followed the happy people. Come on, I followed the happy people. How many of you want to be so ridiculously happy that people just follow you to find out where you're going? May Jesus whack you with an increase. I followed the happy people. Man, I love that story. I love that story. I, listen, I, I got, I'm a little dizzy right now. I'm going to sit down and say this. Now, I'm going to show you a demonstration of faithfulness here in a minute. God's with me. While delivering the Resurrection Sunday message to his church, Pastor Alan Kreider had a stroke. Following a successful surgery to repair the brain bleed, he suffered another stroke, this one worse than the first. He was given no hope of recovery. I had no, no fear. I had no emotion. I, it was like I was in a cocoon. I couldn't have explained it to you. I was, I, there was a strength. It was just supernatural. I heard Kenneth's voice, but he talked to me. He said, Alan Carter, your faith mm. has made you whole. I had called Brother Copeland, and uh, he said, you march into that room, and you tell that man he's not going anywhere. I need him, and the body of Christ needs him, and to get back in his body. But, I mean, if you looked at his body and you looked at the signs and you looked at the MRIs and, you know, it was uh, a no-go, well, you can receive that or not. For three days, we waited. I see the Lord. He said, you cannot stay. They're calling you back. They called us to the door, but the little nurse was grinning. I said, He's, he woke up, and she said, yes, he did. Every day of the next 45 was a constant fight for Alan's life. He received a tracheotomy and a feeding tube. Hemorrhaging caused by hospital negligence and an allergic reaction to medication nearly killed him. It was overwhelming, the support, the support of the Copelands, the support of the ministries, the support of, of Covenant Friends. His room looked like a kindergarten room because 
everybody who sent us a scripture, we would write it on um, a, a poster, and he had poster boards all over his room with scripture, because I didn't, I wanted him when he opened his eyes to see the word of the living God, because the word is life and health to his flesh. We had the word going in his room 24/7. I, if we go in there and and the nurse had turned it off, we'd say, "You leave this word on all the time." Through favor with the neurosurgeon, Alan was accepted and transferred into a rehab hospital. However, with no insurance and the hospital and surgery bills already mounting, the Criders were required to pay $6,000 a week up front in cash. I want you to know, my God, through the body of Christ, provided every single day. After a total of 90 days in hospitals, Alan Crider was released to go home. Brother Copeland said, you need to come to Southwest, which that was going to be a challenge because he was in a wheelchair. He couldn't walk. He couldn't dress himself. He couldn't bathe himself. So uh, his precious armor bearer came with us and helped me. And uh, we came. I experienced the working of miracles and the gift of healing for the first time in a long time. And I knew I had it. And within three months of, of being here in 2010 at the Southwest, he was back in the pulpit. And he may have had some help, but he preached. And each week it got stronger and stronger and stronger. I knew as I walked through this, I had to have his word in order to walk this whole thing out. I always get a word. Always. Always. And it keeps me moving. Mm -hmm. And I go from faith to faith. Alan has progressed from a wheelchair to walking confidently on his own. His voice and dexterity continue to improve. When we faced what we faced six years ago, where would I have been had I not been taught how to walk by faith and not by sight? That's all I do is I watch the Word. When I go to bed, I put my earphones in and I listen to the Word, because the Word's my life, the Word's my strength, the Word's my hope. It's my everything, and I don't know how people live without it. These two won't take anything less than wholeness, soundness, nothing missing, nothing broken. Stay tuned. <laughs> We're not done yet. I'm Anthony Greco from Calgary, Alberta. Back in 1982, I gave my life to Christ, and I started watching uh, whatever Christian programs were available in our area, and there was only a few back then, and one of them was Kenneth Copeland. And when I understood the power of confessing God's Word, that radically changed my life my, by changing how I saw myself, how I saw God, how I saw God's Word, and His plan for me. My wife and I, who I met on the mission field, we began to do these festivals all over the world, you know, uh, open air, stadium, uh, gospel outreaches, praying for the sick, demonstrating the resurrection of Christ, seeing thousands that come to Jesus. Everything we came into our ministry went straight to missions. And so I realized, you know, we need to start taking a salary. We've got to take care of our own needs. And it was a big step of faith for us. So this is back in, you know, 90. 94, 95, I think it was, and uh, I said, all right, let's pay each other a salary. Let's, let's get paid $15,000 a year each, and uh, you know, we have to take care of our own needs, and, and so that's what we decided to do, and that was a big step of faith for us. The very week I decided to do that, I got a, two days later, I got a check in the mail from Kenneth Copeland Ministries Canada for $1,000. Man, I was so excited. I wanted to frame that. I wanted to put it on the wall, but I needed it, you know, for, for missions. And so that, and, and I wasn't on the mailing list. Uh, that was from the Canadian office. Someone had, uh, the director at that time had been in one of our services. And uh, we were just so thrilled. And the, the faithful, continuous support from the Copelands into our outreaches means so much because we often take the gospel to places where they, they haven't heard the name Jesus. They haven't had a slew of preachers come. And oftentimes there's maybe one small church. Many times we went, we planted the only church in that region. And so we're so thankful for the generosity of the, uh, of, of the Copelands and for their uh, willingness just to, uh, to sow seeds into this Canadian ministry. When we were pioneering in, in Kazakhstan, that was the first ever open air meeting in the history of Kazakhstan. In one of those meetings, there was a fellow that came, his name was uh, Sergei, who had been a, a drug addict for about 12 years. 
Sergei came to the meeting and he sat on the front row and when I opened up and I read the first scripture, the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to whoever believes. As soon as I read that, he said something just began to be poured all over him and he was glued to that seat where he was sitting. Uh, my last contact with Sergei, he is working uh, in 15 different penitentiaries all over Kazakhstan preaching the gospel you know, to those that are in prison. And so a testimony like that, every partner of KCM can say, hey, that's, I got a part in that. I played a part. I gave and I supported. And so that ministry that's going on today, there are 15 churches, the last, our last report, in penitentiaries all over Kazakhstan. And all that because somebody sowed a seed. You know, I mean, that is it's such a great opportunity when the partners of KCM, when they, they give, because the Copelands, they, they sow that seed into ministries all across you know, the world, really, that go into regions and minister the gospel where they themselves may not go. And so in wh wherever I share the gospel, I know that the partners of KCM, they have a part of that reward. Whether I was in Ethiopia a few years ago, Tanzania last year, Tanzania will be next month, or some of these remote regions you know, in, in Asia or in the former Soviet Union, every soul that comes to Christ, every single person whose life is transformed, experiences Jesus, part of their reward is, goes to those partners of, of, of KCM that, that gave sacrificially, that just sowed and partnered you know, uh, with the ministry. We have a, a church here in Calgary. We started, and today we have a, we have a, a thriving congregation. Uh, we just we bought a building. We're in the middle of a $10 million project, uh, program. And uh, every Sunday, we are seeing people come to Christ. And that is probably one of the greatest miracles that I've experienced. This, and, and we're so thankful because through this whole journey, we have been supported through uh, Kenneth Copeland Ministries and its partners, and it's meant so much to us, especially we started with faith, with very few people standing with us, but to know that Kenneth and Gloria Copeland were standing with us for the, all these years has meant a lot. You know, partnership is really a togetherness, and I think that's one great thing is when God called Kenneth and Gloria Copeland, and when you partner with that, that calling and that anointing and that provision and that favor that's on them, it's on every partner. And so every partner needs to expect the same blessing, the same favor, the same increase, the same presence of the Holy Spirit upon them because what's on the, the one that was called is on the partners as well. And I think some of the great success that we're having today is because we're standing on the shoulders of the ones that pioneered. Thank you, Kenneth and Gloria Copeland and the partners for all your, all your generosity, it means a lot. I think it's like you really get the atmosphere, you feel the presence of the spirit, and you feel so connected to the body. I mean, it's just feel, you feel like your faith is a part, is just joining together with the faith of all the other believers, and it's just, you know, it's such an awesome experience. It feels a little bit like heaven on earth. Hi, we're Austin and Morgan Crank from Faith Church. You know, the Believer's Voice of Victory Network has been so monumental, just helping build our faith. Hearing 24 hours of uncompromised word of faith has it helped us in our marriage, our lives. We've heard things from people in our congregation, just not only as a young couple in our 20s, but also in our young adult friends as well. That's right. A young professional of ours uh, just recently was traveling. He's in medical sales, and he went to Portland, Oregon, and he was talking with a doctor, and what do you know? They start talking about their faith. And while they were talking about their faith, he said, where do you go to church? He said, well, I go to Faith Church in St. Louis, Missouri. And he said, no way. I love the cranks. And he said, how do you know them? He said, well, I always watch them on the Believer's Voice of Victory Network. And now they speak to me all the time. They're one of my favorites. You know, and what I love about that story, too, is he says, not only do I watch it every single day, I tell every single one of my patients to watch that network. Partner with BVOV and Network. It's going to help you. It's going to bless you, not only our lives, but it will do the same exact thing for your life. My name's Don Hunt, and this is my wife, Diana. Uh, we live in Souk in Canada. Brother Copeland was preaching at the uh, convention center in Surrey, and the Lord was so strongly put in my heart I was to go, and I was only able to take in one afternoon. So I got there on my bike. He had uh, to one session. He was already preaching for half an hour, and I went way up high in the forest balcony and sat down. I said, okay, Lord, I'm here, I'm ready. I'm going to receive a word from you today, and I'm all ears. And I sat down, and I, I just was waiting. And as soon as I sat down and I said that, Brother Copeland stops. And, and he just goes over to Brownie Bounds, starts prophesying over her, and he says, and for you and your company, and I went, that's me. <laughs> I'm the company. And he said, out of, out of this 
uh, what I'm doing in your midst, and he, he said a lot of things. He said, um, I want you to continue to believe to raise the dead, and uh, great uh, ministries of miracles and signs and wonders, healing and prosperity will come out of this. But as soon as he said raising of the dead, the Lord had been speaking to me about that, to believe him for that. So I just said, oh, okay, I take that, thank you. I, I'll continue to meditate and re receive that. I just didn't know I'd be the first one. <laughs> I, literally so I meet with a few ladies and we do intercessory prayer every Friday and we changed it for Dominion Day July uh, uh, July 1st on a Wednesday and we were praying and then we were it was quite a shift a, a spirit of intercession and authority that came on us and things were shifting in the heavenlies and I stopped I said Heather you know I just really sense there's gonna be an attack in our life and, she, and I said we better deal with it now well little did I know four hours later that this accident would occur. So I'm on a second floor balcony and I was pitching countertops and bookcases off and there was no railing. So my, I was unwisely up there without a railing and I got either fell, pitched, I wasn't sure, something clipped my arm, went straight down towards the ground and I saw the rocks down below and I, I was gonna hit it with my head and I knew it would be bad. And before I hit the rocks, I just, out of my spirit, because of the word that's sown into us, uh, you just never know what's going to come out in a pickle. <laughs> so anyway, out of my spirit, I just screamed, Jesus, I claim healing. And I hit the rocks hard, and, and I heard this crack and, and a blinding light, and then it went dark. When I was down there, two angels picked me up, a big one on the left and the right, and they escorted me down this corridor, and it was like gravel with grass and flowers and then I saw a bright light and I thought to myself oh lots of people have a bright light experience right and then it got clearer and more detail and more detail and then it became sharp and it was like the kingdom of heaven came into view and I got closer and closer as these angels are literally escorting me there and then I saw Jesus he was waiting for me to come right to the threshold and then he said no not yet and then the angels on the sound of his voice just whipped me around and they marched me back down the corridor that I just come from and I woke up in my body on the ground in excruciating pain and I was screaming my head my neck and the paramedics when they come they strap you like you know you've had a severed your neck and uh, put me in the ambulance and as they raced to the hospital I heard them saying oh, we've lost her she stopped breathing quick and they said get the gas on her and they said Diana stay with us I just stopped breathing and everything got calm and things, I, things started to go dark and I started going backwards and I knew I would just turn around and see him and I go back and I went, oh great, I get to go back. Um, and then I heard Jesus say at my left shoulder, right there, he was right there and he said, it's my breath in your lungs. And he said it again, it's my breath in your lungs. And I just remember thinking, okay. And I, I just took my first breath and I said, it's your breath in my lungs, Jesus. And they went, what's she saying? She's back. And they took the mask, take the mask off. And, they, and I just kept saying it. It's your breath in my lungs, Jesus, all the way to the hospital. So it's really a thank you to the Lord first for being such a wonderful savior <laughs> and for his love. And, you know, heaven is a wonderful place and it's just all about Jesus. <laughs> and, that, and that the word sown in us, uh, um, you know, the partner letters that we get from Brother Copeland and Sister Gloria, they, they mean a lot to us. I just want Brother Colton and Sister Gloria to know that, that we take those letters and we read them, we pray over them, we thank God for them, that, that Brother Copeland and Sister Gloria honor um, their spiritual father, Oral Roberts' mandate to take good care of your partners. Well, they take good care of their partners. And when you plug into ministries that God leads you to, to partner with, get ready for radical stuff to happen, signs, wonders, breakthroughs, things that were stuck get unstuck. It's the blessing. It's just the love of God, the favor of God in these ministries that, that are God's honored and is honoring us by allowing them to sow into our lives. And we're so grateful and thankful. Our lives have been so touched and changed and we're just getting our feet wet. I'm Diane Shaw. I'm from Calgary. I work in counseling and psychotherapy now. And uh, I work out of a home office. Um, I started off as a medical doctor in family practice and I went back uh, to get a master's in counseling degree because I felt that that's where God was using me the most. That's where I felt like I had um, a special desire. I'm uh, a Roman Catholic. I was born again um, 
when I was 14 years old and uh, that was after listening to a TV program on the Jesus people in California and uh, I prayed and asked Jesus to come into my heart and was born again and three years later through the charismatic renewal in the Catholic Church I was baptized in the Holy Spirit and some 10 years later or so, I guess, it was 1984, I was listening to the TV on a Sunday morning and uh, just caught this um, program with uh, this guy talking that was, uh, in my mind, just another TV evangelist and I was about to change the channel when I started listening to what he was saying and realized that um, he was not just any TV evangelist, it was Kenneth. and I sensed right away that he was for real, that he had a true anointing of the Holy Spirit on him. If I want to succeed in life, I need to be um, filled up with the Word all the time, every day. And the Believer's Voice of Victory broadcasts are how I start my day every day. And uh, it's what sustains me and it's what, it's what guides me. It's the guiding principle in my life. I remember Kenneth listening to this because I am self-employed and uh, someone had asked him, should I be tithing on my net or on my gross? And he said, well, he says, I tithe on my gross and God makes sure that I always have enough money for my taxes every year. <laughs> and I had been in a situation for a number of years, especially after going back to school where I'd been going into debt to pay my taxes every year and, and uh, you know, another one of Another thing that I have adopted in my life from the Copelands is um, the scripture about not going into debt, about owing no man anything but to love him. And I can say now that I am debt free and continue to stay debt free. And uh, this one year I needed $5,000 to pay my taxes. And I had heard that um, from Kenneth about, you know, tithing on the growth and having enough money to pay your taxes. So I was believing God for the money to pay my taxes and it was coming up to the deadline. And the phone rang and uh, this guy that I didn't know introduced himself. He was a stockbroker and he says, do you remember um, a patient of yours about 10 years ago as a gift gave you a stock? And I, at first I couldn't remember and then Oh yeah, this was good. He, he was a stockbroker and he'd given me a gift of a uh, stock that was worth $50. And he says, I know this stock's gonna go up, so I, I bought you one. I said, oh, thank you. I had no idea even where it was in, invested, you know, completely forgot about it. 10 years later, this guy calls me, he says, well, I've, I've been managing that uh, stock. He says, I'm just wondering what you want me to do with it. He says, um, do you know how much it's worth now? And I said, no, and he says, $5,000 which was exactly how much I needed to pay my taxes. And I even had enough money to pay parking to go down to my accountant to pay the taxes. So that's, that's my testimony about uh, God's faithfulness and, you know, as far as sowing and reaping is concerned. Well, partnership to me means that I know that I always have agreement in prayer. Um, any, whenever I send in my donations, I do it by mail, I don't do it online, I do it the old way because I like to actually go through the process of you know, putting it in the mailbox and naming my tithe when I put it, naming my offering is, you know, I remember being taught um, by this ministry and so when I do that, uh, you know, they, they always have a place where you can put your prayer requests, write your prayer requests on, on your offering and I do that and they always respond with, you know, we stand in agreement with you for this, whatever it was, uh, you know, I asked them to pray with me. They individualize and personalize their response and and I have had answers to prayer, you know, that, that um, they have agreed with me on. Um, I guess for me, uh, you know, a ministry that I want to share in the blessings of, and, and I know that's another thing I learned from Kenneth, right, is that, uh, you know, when you receive a prophet of God, you receive the prophet's reward, and so I want to be a part of this ministry's reward, um, which I know is great. My name is Eli Entz, and this is my wife, Haley Entz. He's Canadian, and I'm South African, and we had moved back to South Africa for a couple of years, and that's where we first got introduced to a Rhema church in Durban and that's when we first started learning Word of Faith and 
faith Christianity, the very surface of it. And we actually came back to Canada and we had absolutely nothing. We had a two-year-old and a two-month-old and we came back and had enough money to live on for a week and two little children and absolutely nothing. No winter clothes, like you couldn't start with more nothing than we had. Really just tithed our way right out of that whole situation and continued to be blessed and, and learn more about that. And then over time started watching BVOV and we continued to tithe and continued to sow and God just kept increasing us and uh, made a way for us to get our first home. And but, with, but we had a mortgage because we really hadn't grasped the, the debt-free aspect of faith yet. But as we were learning and more about that, I really got that in me that I wanted to be mortgage-free and debt-free. So I would keep on seeking the Lord and then He would show us different things to do and we would obey. The very first time George and Gloria taped their first week and we started watching, and that's when I think we got a revelation of getting serious about wanting to be mortgage-free. And by now, my son, my younger son, is in his last year of high school, and I had always had a goal to be mortgage-free and debt-free before my youngest child graduated from high school. And here we were, months and I said to God well I can't do this in my own strength this is it's not possible for me like you, you, you in the natural it doesn't look possible and so we made a decision to actually fast from all our secular TV shows and the other natural things and to order the financial breakthrough package and to do it over and over again. And we just kept doing it. And so we did it the first 10 days and then your, the way you think starts to change a little bit. So then we did it another 10 days and it goes a bit deeper and did it another 10 days and then just kept standing on all of those scriptures and all of those promises. We were just driving home and I got a download from the Lord. If this is, this is what you have, use it and I got very specific instructions about what to do and it was partly to do with using our contracting company to to go and build and sell a house and so and it, it took boldness mm -hmm. and stepping out in faith mm -hmm. and so we just acted on that and everything fell into place and the house was sold within less than a week. We didn't even have a, a second open house. And so that was our supernatural sale. Mm -hmm. And from that, the Lord showed us how to take those resources and pay our mortgage down, and all before my son graduated. So that was like all standing in faith and standing on all those promises, and all came to pass in a very quick period of time, because what was not possible in the natural he might work i just would like to say the word works we've just found over the years when we needed god we realized we had to get in the word it was us who had to make the move to get in the word put the word first place mm -hmm. and every time the word works we've learned so much through watching these different packages, the healing package, the wellness, the relationship package, the financial freedom thing. We keep doing these over and over because we need to re-immerse ourselves. We constantly have to put that in so that we're ready. And then George and Gloria, we just can't wait for it to yeah. begin again because we, we want to keep moving in mm -hmm. step with financial freedom and stay free. Where's she at? She, you got healed online? Watching online? What do you mean you got healed online? I got healed online. Well, from what? 
I had a stroke. Uh -huh. I used to be a professional pianist and used to play in healing meetings like this. Okay. And you were watching online from where? Sir, well, from Farmer's Branch in Dallas, Texas, which is about 45 minutes to an hour away. Okay. And I asked the angels to get us here. I said, husband, we have to go. My husband, Breck, right, we have to your go. Right, here's your husband? Okay, so you... And then on the way, you called for shingles? Yes. My husband has shingles. Okay, but I'm talking about you. you but you, me? Yeah, 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 you. Me. Talk to me, what happened? I can start feeling my fingers again. They're starting to work. Like this. Like this. Like this. All over the place. Come on. Your oh. name is... Your name. So this vibrating, this shaking, tell me what this is, these tremors. What caused this? Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Hashimoto. And it's, she has over 80 illnesses. And over 80 thyroid. illnesses that caused by what? Bad thyroid. A bad thyroid. Mm -hmm. That's your body temperature. That's connected to your thymus gland, correct? Your thymus. And I died, almost died last week. Yeah. And I died three more times this week because mm -hmm. my blood pressure won't stay high enough. No. You're, you came all this way. I came all this way. Yes, I can feel my toes. You can feel your toes. <laughs> Come on! What's the matter with this group? What's the matter? Come on! Move the chair, move the chair. Go, go. Get her up, get her up, get her up. Just walk, just walk, 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 walk,
come, come, come. She was what? She has not played piano for 12 years. care six years ago. She what? She was in hospice care six years hospice? ago. Hospice? When? Six years ago. Six years ago. She's almost died at least a no, this times. But there's no tremors. They're gone. She was tremors all the time. What are we going to do with this? If any you know how to Twitter. Who knows how to Twitter? Mm -hmm. Facebook. Let me see. Get on it tonight. Tell them to get a red eye. It leaves you like, ah. Uh, did you see how bad? Who's this? What, what? This is one of our pastors on staff. Tell, tell them what you did with her. Tell well, when she pulled up, she just came right up and she was moving. Her muscles were shaking like they were out of control. And she really couldn't get herself out. And when she sat in that chair, she just hit, the, she just hit that chair hard. So my, my, my. That's and a, you picked her up. You picked yeah, her we up. just picked her up and put her there. Oh, wow. Hallelujah. <laughs> They're all good. They're all good, but there are a few that leave you like, oh, what did I just see? A miracle! No, no, just stay there. No, 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 please stay there, please. 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 The presence in this place right now. Oh my. Come on, whatever you're facing, put your hands on your body. Diabetes, whatever you're facing at the moment. We're not going to lose track here. We're going to celebrate some more. We're going to bring it to the altar. But before I do, you know, we don't want you to get overshadowed or over or swallowed up in. Yet, how can we not? Mm. Mm. Oh, Lord, tonight, right here, right here, miracle on the mountain. Many. It doesn't say miracle on the mountain. It says miracles. And how faithful you have been. And for those that came from so far. And those that drove just a little ways. What a treat you are to us tonight. We never want to leave your presence thinking, oh, there's another great service. There's another great miracle. We want you to know that we know where this came from. 
You said, he that comes to God must believe that he is. And that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Tonight we want to come to a conclusion. Not an emotional conclusion. One based on the truth. One based on what we saw. And they match. You have demonstrated your love tonight. Put your hands up. Come on, say, love, love. Must, be must be demonstrated. Undemonstrated love, undemonstrated love is, lost is lost in words, in, words. in, action, in action, in commitment, in, commitment. in, sacrifice. in sacrifice. But demonstration, demonstration. brings commitment, brings sacrifice. sacrifice. It brings a place brings a of great acknowledgement. Great Tonight, Holy Spirit, I'm in a shift from not knowing to kind of knowing, from believing to being fully persuaded that you are who you say you are, that you can do what your word says you can do. I'm signing up tonight for more of everything that's here. I'm leaving this place radically changed. I will be part of a revolution. I will be part of healing capital of the world. I'll never forget it. In the name of Jesus. Give him a mighty shout. Come on. I had gone for an EKG, I guess about a month ago. And the doctor says, oh, you're fine. You're too young to have any heart problems. And then I went, um, then she said, she says, I'll do an EKG anyway. Mm -hmm. And she says, she came back, she says, she says, you're fine, but I'm going to send you for a treadmill test. She sent me for the treadmill test. I haven't gotten it back, but the, the symptoms were still that bothering me. Yeah. It's, it's fluttering of the heart, a palpitation, or you can hear the pulse when you're laying down. And that's not right. And I knew that wasn't right. So I've been standing by faith for my healing. And today, it was like the Lord says, okay, you overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. So you go up there and you give your testimony and you stand, you continue to stand. And from now on, you don't let those symptoms come back. And that's what Kenneth was saying. He was saying, don't let those symptoms come back into your house, into your body. You fight against them. Don't fall for symptoms. Don't fall for the symptoms. You, Praise God. Don't fall for that. Well, uh, I, well, I, I believe I received, but I'm still hurting. Get your mind off yeah. of the hurting and keep it yeah, over on yeah. Jesus. Receive, keep receive, your faith turned on. What you're doing is working against those symptoms. And the other symptom I had was lower back pain, and it was just totally, completely gone. And, and in my stomach, <laughs> I don't know what was going on there, but I knew I received, Kenneth, we're talking about something about stomach problems. And I said, I received that from my stomach as well. So I just received everything today, anything and everything, and I'm just standing for everything. You got a total body makeover. <laughs> I got a total body makeover, <laughs> total attitude makeover, total everything. It's been wonderful. I was a drug addict, alcoholic, um, uh, through just kind of start out in high school. You know, when I was a kid, I started drinking when I was about 11 and uh, started uh, smoking weed when I was 14. And by the time I was 15, I was sticking needles in my arm, got kicked out of college. That stuff, it just, just destroyed everything. Got here, um, found out I had a knack for business. Every business that I opened, it just said take off. That's probably one of the worst things that could happen to me because that was just fuel for my, for my drug habits. Kevin Alexander was on a road leading straight for destruction until one day he made a U-turn. Uh, I was going down the road one day and I was training a guy to come to work for me. <clears throat> had a 16th of cocaine in my front pocket and a bottle of whiskey in the front seat. He pointed at me and he said, you got a drinking problem. And I said, just when I run out, I said, that's the only problem I got. But he said, did your wife leave you? And I said, yeah. I said, how'd you know that? He said, the Lord told me. He said, I'm here for one reason and one reason only. That's to introduce you to the Lord Jesus Christ. So he said, when you're ready, pull this truck over. And uh, um, I probably went about a half a mile down the road. And uh, it was like somebody grabbed the steering wheel of that truck and yanked it over in a bar ditch. I said, let me see what this Jesus of yours has got. And we said a prayer. And uh, I knew something on the inside of me clicked. 
I knew that my life would never be the same. Kevin's life took a turn in the right direction that day. He began attending Eagle Mountain International Church and feeding on the teachings of Kenneth Copeland and pastors George and Terry Pearsons. You don't have to climb your way up to the top of anything. He sets you in the body as it pleases him. And I'm telling you, that has happened to me over and over. Can you testify, church? But the same way that I had that desire to go and party, to do the drugs, I then had the same desire for God's Word and to know Jesus. From the time I got saved, it was almost a year later that uh, God restored my family, brought my wife home. I just got focused on Him. As my life changed, as I followed God, she just fell in and started following that. And that's how he restored it. With Kevin's life turned around and his family restored, God's next direction for him was to launch out and bring others to their own life-changing encounter. So I knew something on the inside of me. I knew I was called to ministry. And uh, Pastor Terry, one night uh, before all this started, Pastor Terry, she was speaking one night under the anointing of the Lord. And the Spirit of the Lord said through her, pull your finances, pull your family together, and be ready. I'm calling you. I always tell people we're the hands and feet of Jesus. And if you see our food pantry downtown Fort Worth, it is just a, it's just a little ugly brick building. And uh, we, we was able to feed over 21,000 people, get to share the gospel in there with them. Then we've got our church also that, uh, that we uh, have in Fort Worth. But I guess the main thing that he uses is these uh, discipleship homes. The first thing we're going to teach them is about who they are in Christ, spirit, soul, and body. Now in phase two, that's when, when they start going out and doing more work with the ministry. So that's when you really start seeing these, uh, these qualities develop. And then after that, then in phase three, that's the final four months, that's where we allow them to get a job. And if you can change the way a man sees himself, you can change, it. You can change his whole life. It's not about what I've done in my past. It's not, it's not about what I can do for the Lord in the future. It's, what, it's about what Jesus has done on the cross. And that is the only way that we can have victory in our life is, is if our focus is on the Lord, on Jesus. God is no respecter of persons. If God will do it for one man, he'll do it for another. If God took my life and he turned around a drug addict, alcoholic, wife beater, mean, hurt more people in my life, you know, if he can do it for me, than he'd do it for anybody else. I grew up in the inner city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, and some of the most obscure, violent, and poverty-stricken conditions. Uh, I grew up without both of my parents. My mother and my father, they were not around. Um, they were actually both uh, criminals and um, convicted felons and they spent a lot of time in prison, a lot of time on the streets. So I became all of the things that I saw. Um, I became a criminal, and I became a serious criminal. Nashawn Walker was incarcerated for crimes that he committed with his father. By the age of 19, Nashawn was a convicted felon, facing charges that carried a maximum mandatory sentence of 85 years. As soon as I walk in the cell, there was a gentleman on the bottom bunk, and then there was another gentleman sitting at the desk. They both were reading Bibles. And then I came and I said, wow, you guys have Bibles? And the guy said, yeah, you want one? Here. So from that point on, I began to read my Bible. My cellmate, he led me to the Lord. So for 18 months, I never came out of my cell, really. I did here and there, but I just devoured the Bible. All right, just reading the Bible back and forth. As a new Christian, Nashan devoted himself to the Word of God, and his life transformed. With the assistance of the Holy Spirit, he learned to read and started a Bible study in prison. When his father assumed responsibility for the crimes they committed, Nishan was miraculously released after serving 18 months in a cell. He was just 21 years old when he returned to the streets of Philadelphia. When I actually joined uh, a church and I was introduced to Kenneth Copeland Ministries at that point and my life took off. I ended up graduating from uh, the technical school um, six months after I was released from <laughs> from prison. So we went through the admission process and they accepted me in college. 
and 70% of all of my schooling was paid for. And this happened in less than a year from me being released from prison. I was in my uh, dorm room and I was worshiping God and the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to go get your mom. I went back to Philadelphia, I got my mom, took her out, brought her back to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. The church was there helping me out. We put her in a, a women's mission. 10 years later, she's been clean. She got saved, praise God. She went to college. She graduated with honors. And now she is one of the head counselors in the same program that she started in. And she's a partner with Kenneth Copeland Ministries. Nishan is standing for his entire family to know the Lord. After serving time for 12 years, his father was released and restored to his son. Within just three and a half years, this young man defied all limits by attending and graduating from a prestigious university, earning a second degree in business administration that transitioned into a very successful career. So the first thing, he has stability in his life. He has a beautiful wife. Uh, they have a great relationship, great children, and a great family. He is consistently lived the Word of God. He's a great leader in the community. He go talk to the inmates. And when he goes there and, and open his mouth, the inmates just open their hearts completely because they can see what God can do. Nishan continues his corporate career and teaches business classes at a local college. Ordained into ministry by his mentor, Nishan was called to pastor a church and to establish his own ministry. I am a faith man as a result of listening to and being a part of the anointing that's on Kenneth Copeland's life and on uh, Gloria Copeland's life as well. Transformation after transformation after transformation. Just, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a product of their ministry, period. I'm Robert Hurst. I'm from St. Albert, Alberta. My company uh, blessed me for many years of service and they gave me a new watch and $2,000 to take the family on a ski vacation. My two daughters were skiing together, Sydney, my 15-year-old, and uh, Lydia, my 17-year-old. And they had both wiped out on the exact spot on the hill at the same time. And Lydia, she gets up and she looks over and she sees her sister laying there. And so she scoots over to her and she's in a puddle of blood. Um, her face is right in the snow and she's twitching. My wife and I, my youngest and oldest, we're sitting in the chalet having some lunch and then the, the cell phone rings and it's a lady who says, I'm so-and-so and, -so, and um, your daughter has been in a ski accident. She's unconscious. Um, my husband, who's a ski patrol, is with her right now and we're gonna bring her down to the ski patrol hut. As we're skiing down towards that hut, we had to just, you know, just dealing with fear and just stay calm, stay calm. It's probably not a big deal. Okay, she, she bumped her head, went out, blacked out for a little bit, freaked everybody out, she's gonna be okay. And then while wow, we're all kind of congregating behind us, Sydney gets shot into the, the first aid hut. So I walk in there, and so that's the first time I see her. She's in this, on this sled, completely strapped in, oxygen tank on her neck brace, uh, completely unconscious and dry blood on her face already. I grabbed her hand, and she's still unconscious, and I said, Sid, Daddy's right here. You will live and not die, and you will declare the works of the Lord. And then I started commanding, just as it came to you know, spine, you be healed in Jesus' name. Neck, no injuries in Jesus' name. Head trauma, no in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you for, and, and it just started flowing, and then ambulance comes, takes her out of the room, and I'm like, okay, let's go, because we're still up on the mountain. We gotta get down to the, the, the town of Jasper. They actually enlisted somebody else from the ski hill who was a, 
ambulance attendant because they needed two workers to work on Sydney. Um, of course, Denise knows this, I don't know this, and she's hearing things in the back of the ambulance, like, stay with us, Sydney, stay with us. And I get this text that says, uh, hurry on into town while we're, we're going to Edmonton, um, Star's helicopter is picking her up. She'll be there in about an hour. Do you have anybody who can meet her? Yes, yes, yes. And off we go. And we knew that that four hour drive was gonna be our, that was gonna be our time of hanging on or letting go. And, and how are you gonna respond to this? There's a CD that where Kenneth is just reading healing scriptures. And so to play that, oh, we must have run that through two or three times and let's play that again. And we'd sing some songs and let's hear that again. So we get this, this phone call, they did the CAT scan. There's no, no blood on the brain at all. We spontaneously just started bawling. We were so like, yes, yes. Just like you say, Lord. Um, we get to the hospital, of course, and, and now we, we get to see our kid and um, she's in ICU. And then at one point in the morning, um, that was the first time she woke up and then Mama got to talk to her, her 15-year-old for the first time since this all happened. Of course, most of it Sydney doesn't remember at all. Um, aerosurgeon came back, kept doing checkups, checkups. Um, yep, you are doing extremely well. A few bruises on the face at the picture show. And we got all this information from the hospital about, you know, serious head trauma and, and, and <clears throat> you know, what to expect. And we appreciate that information, but we know something that they don't. Um, Sydney, she did, you know, in, in, her, in her schooling, it, it, in no time all the bruising and swelling went down. And um, I think she stayed home for a week or two from school. So a week in the hospital and then a week afterwards, exams were done, but it was about, a week after she was home where she, she, she had no visual, you couldn't tell anything had happened. It's the, the Copelands, that's what revealed to us you're healed before you feel it or see it. When you're in those situations, you don't know how you're going to react. You need to get ready before this happens because if it happens, that's not the time you grab your Bible. And to have those verses so firmly established, it, it just then at that moment when the storm hits, you know where to turn. I'm uh, Ron and this is my wife, Lorna Sylvester from Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. We are the founders of Twin Lakes Ranch Ministries. We did rodeo schools, rodeo Bible camps on our ranch, and they were developing too fast to stay on the ranch and run the ranch. So God said, sell a ranch, and I'll show you where to relocate. Actually, when the Lord told us uh, to sell a ranch and relocate, uh, it took 10 years before we find found the property. It's the Word of God that kept us through those 10 years. Yeah. And listening to KCM and being encouraged that God wants us to, He wants to give us good things. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have seen, that God is a good God. Mm -hmm. And so He gave us this beautiful place to 205 acres right alongside the highway. So we're just redeveloping it again. We um, had to pay 300000 for this land, but we didn't have the total amount. All we had is 100000 And a family came to us a week before we paid the final payment, said, we'll loan you 200000 and you pay it back however God decides for you to pay it. So we paid for, what, three years? Mm -hmm. And uh, then one year at a, at a uh, big show in Regina, uh, a cattle show, a family came the second morning and said, uh, we want to pay off the land loan, 146000 And our heart has been to be debt free because of course, that's what we've heard, and we know that's what the Word says, that we should be debt-free and owe no man anything but to love. And that's what our heart is, to love people and to be debt-free. And so we didn't want to go into debt at all. And so from that day forward, once that land was paid off, we declared we will never be in debt again. Yeah. We, we serve a God of increase, yeah. and He is all-sufficient all for everything that we need. He wants to give us every good thing. And so since that time, we had a, um, a vision that we should uh, believe for a manager's house on the ranch. 
and it was um, 200,000 that we were believing for. Uh, we had um, a, a family say they would match up to $100,000 until the end of March. And so we just declared that was coming and the double was going to be there. And then we had, just before the end of March, we had another family Facebook a message and said, what are you still believing for for the house? And we said 50,000. They said, the Lord's told us to give you the 50,000. So immediately that doubled to 100,000. Oh. And so that came, so we received in the five and a half months, $200,000 for a manager's house. And mm -hmm. so faith cometh by hearing mm -hmm. and hearing by the word of God. And we teach that so much in our ministry. Uh, we're involved in the community to draw people in. And uh, we do kids rodeo every spring, which is 10 and under. And uh, so we've had people that come into that kids rodeo that once they came on the land, Jesus actually met with them that they needed him. We didn't even talk about Jesus other than I prayed before the rodeo. And uh, they, God just led them to him. So what an excitement to see that happening because of the land being cleansed and made whole. That's where the vision started yeah. with the Cowboys and then now it's expanding and expanding and so we actually do quite a few conferences as well and then that's where we can train people and equip them in the Word of God. Every Tuesday night we do what we call a DVD night. Uh, we have actually followed uh, Kenneth and Gloria so much in there and George and Bill Winston and all the connections of through uh, the Copelands that have given us hope, we show that. And so we have people coming every Tuesday night to be a part of that. And we've seen a lot of salvations in the camps. It's just so exciting to see what God's doing. We just want to thank KCM and, and EMIC and all the staff and, and the workers and everybody that put their heart to following after God. Mm. and. I, it's hard to explain how it's changed our lives, but it has totally changed our lives. We're here tonight, all the stars are blacking. Hills Farm do not exist today. Where would, you, where, would you like where would I be? I'd probably be dead or in jail. I think of this place as a treasure. So I feel like it's a miracle I found this place. I came from Virginia and grew up on the east coast of the states. There's nothing about like we can see. We have something to offer for people whose lives need changing. We believe that the Lord has anointed this place. I arrived here just a little over seven years ago, and I was scared, and I felt like I was a real loser in a lot of areas. I felt very hopeless, and when I came here, I didn't really want to do a lot of the things that I had to do here, but deep down there was this part of me that knew that this was a safe place where God was surrounding me with family, people who loved me and who had the wisdom that I needed to get through the things that I had to get through, who were going to faithfully guide me through those things, and who were, frankly, people who were able to call me on my stuff. I came to Wagner Hills Farm 15 years ago. It was here after being in addiction for 10 years that I, I surrendered, I gave up. So I was in a greenhouse that was just up the hill over there and I was, I was pretty sick and I was watering some plants and I, and I prayed, okay, God, this is where my life is. I can't afford cigarettes, I can, I can hardly move, I burned every bridge and uh, if you can do better with my life, then you can have it. And, and it was a real place to surrender because that's when I felt him speaking into my life. So I, I, I came into the building and, and just talked to the director at the time and said, I think I'm supposed to, I think I'm supposed to give my life to the Lord. And he said, let's pray together. And so that's, that's where it started and that's led me on a journey that now I'm here and helping to direct this facility. My own life has definitely been changed by coming here. Changed me to be someone who cares and maybe loves more, has more humility for God than when I came, when I thought I had a lot to offer. My name is Philip Schroeder. I've been at the farm here for over 10 years. I started as a resident, 
then went through the servant leader program and now am one of the code program directors. A lot of the leaders here have, have come through the program and, and know what it's like to feel hopeless. I see firsthand uh, working here and serving here of, of people's lives being changed and, and that's, it's, that's a cool thing. KCM partner Hardy Higgins had recently returned from serving as an army chaplain during the beginning of the Iraq War when he and his wife Young Hee attended the Southwest Believers Convention. Kenneth Copeland was honored to invite Chaplain Higgins to share this inspiring testimony of God's covenant of protection. When we found out that we were going to be going to Iraq, uh, first thing I did, of course, was go to the Lord with my wife and pray. The second thing I did was get online with my chaplain assistant and order no fear here for our troops. The other thing I ordered was the uh, Psalm 91 card and you sent them to me free. I shared the cards with the soldiers. Before we went out on any convoy we prayed and each vehicle had Psalm 91 in it and soldiers carrying it. We had over 6,000 soldiers deployed with the brigade and through the whole war as most of them were up front. Not one was wounded. Hallelujah. After the war, we had a visit from a very high executive general uh, who came north of uh, Baghdad where we were stationed. And we had to get him down to Baghdad to International Airport to catch a plane. So our command sergeant major got a convoy together of five vehicles and they went down, took him to uh, what we call buy up now, Baghdad International, let him go and then they came back. As they were coming back, it was around 10:30, 11 o'clock at night. And as they went under an underpass, the Iraqis on top of the overpass fired a rocket propelled grenade at the sergeant major's vehicle. Now it hit the right rear tail light square in the middle. It punched the tail light, lands and everything through, and then dropped back, rolled over to the side, and scooted along the side of the road. The sergeant major is sitting there and he says he kind of drew up like this while watching it, and he said the whole world, his whole life, flashed right before him. That rocket went 20 meters in front and then exploded. <laughs> One of the drivers in the convoy said, we were driving through and it appeared like we were in a tunnel and all the bullets were going over us but none hit us. They were firing machine guns down on the convoy, rocket propelled grenades. There was not one bullet hole in any vehicle. <laughs> He looked at me and he told me that story. He said, I don't believe in God, but I'm beginning to wonder. <laughs> this is my wife, Young Hee. This is from the 130th Engineer Brigade. This is the Bible all the soldiers were given. Inside. Are the cards you gave us. Psalm 91. And we carried them with us everywhere. The other thing I had was printed out Psalm 91, which I carried in my pocket and in my Bible. In the first of July, when I got a plane and left Iraq, I got about two hours out of there and I reached in my pocket, I pulled out my Bible and this paper and began to read Psalm 91 again. And I have to tell you, uh, unashamedly, I cried like a baby knowing God's love was with me. Marvelous, marvelous. I'm so oh, and I would like to give this to you for your prayers and for your partners who've been a blessing to us and to the soldiers in Iraq. Thank you. Praise God. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so glad you came.
Hallelujah. You bless me so. Thank you, sir. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Will you accept my salute, sir? Thank you. Praise the Lord. God bless you.
Yeah, just lift your hands. He's a good father. Just tell him, Daddy, you're a good daddy. You're a good daddy. We love you.